this afternoon. We have seven items on the agenda. We are going to continue item one to March 19th at the request of the mayor and acknowledged by LAWA. So item one is done. And items number three, we are going to, anyone here for item number three? Who are you with? The zoo department. The zoo department. Annual collection. Okay, we're going to approve item number three on the re-exemption. So you can go back and tour the zoo, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. The tranquility, the zoo is a tranquil place. We're gonna consider items number two and four together. So two and four are going to be considered together. And item number five, we're going to be discussing number five. And number six is the CRA MOU, which we're going to discuss. And number seven, we have a problem with number seven. Okay, so that'll be the rundown. So if you're here for item number one, you can return to the airport and the rest of them will continue. So we're gonna start with number two and four. Two and four. Item number two is a memorandum from the mayor relative to the exemption of one investment officer position. This is for the office of the treasurer. And for item four, uh, there's also an exemption uh, memorandum from the mayor, and this is regarding one director of cash management services for the office of the treasurer as well. Are these positions currently filled, or are they new positions? Krista Biner with the city treasurer's office. The investment officer position is currently vacant, and for the director of cash management, we have um, an employee act in an acting position. Okay, what happened to the previous investment officer? It's been vacant for some time, I believe since 2005. So why would we want to fill that position now when we're having difficulty in finances for the city of Los Angeles? Because these positions have a direct uh, responsibility for generating revenue. They manage the city's $7 billion investment portfolio. So how we manage since the investment officer position, how many investment officers are there? There's currently three investment, well, there's two investment officer ones, an investment officer two, and a chief investment officer. And with all the financial difficulties we're having, the mayor is supporting this exemption for the investment officer position, item number two. Mm -hmm. And item number four, what about number four? Um, the director of cash management um, is responsible for the oversight of the city's entire banking function and the annual cash flow of the city, which is around $60 billion of in and out cash flow. Um, it's a really critical position relative to maintaining the banking relationship and implementing best practices in the industry. And who's handling that now? Um, right now we have an acting um, person doing part of it, and as assistant treasurer, I am doing part of it as well. And are you folks fully staffed in the office? I believe we're pretty close to fully staffed. And who you folks represent? I'm Lorena Valdez, also with the treasurer's office. I'm the personnel officer. Uh, Tom Juarez, I'm the investment officer too with the treasurer's office. And I'm Hal Noctree, but I'm the chief investment officer. Okay, what about the CAO, CLA? What are their buy-ins on this? Anybody? I think it's really a judgment call um, on your part, Councilman, as to whether or not you want to uh, approve the exemption. Um, I think that there's two different issues here. There's a difference between the managed uh, hiring process uh, and whether or not you're going to approve this exemption. Uh, with respect to the investment officer, my understanding from the report from the mayor's office uh, is that um, 
this position has not traditionally been exempt. Um, there has been an eligible list. My understanding is that the eligible lists have been exhausted. Um, so they're seeking the exemption so that they can hire the position, uh, hire an individual who would be qualified as soon as possible, as opposed to waiting for the exam process to be completed. Um, I, from a personal standpoint, I think that there are some benefits uh, to an exemption for a specialized class such, such as this. Uh, that way the department can do targeted recruitment for the experience that they're seeking. Um, if your concern is whether or not this position should be filled uh, as part of managed, uh, part of the managed hiring process, I think that that's a different decision. Well, I was going to cover them both under the concerned lack of finances, and since we haven't had it filled for a while, the urgency of it at this particular financial situation for the city, when we're asking unions to open up contracts for salary renegotiations, it seems that if we're 150 some million dollars in the wrong direction, why would we support something that hasn't been there? I think what the department has not responded to is the question that you had asked uh, with respect to why it would be beneficial for them to fill a position that's been vacant for several years. Part of what I heard their explanation was it's a workload issue. Um, obviously, the quality of the investments that are provided by the treasurer is critical to revenue generation for the city. So maybe the department would like to respond to that question. Please yes. do. Um, you know, one, of, one of our objectives in the investment division, if not our most important objective, is to generate interest earnings for the general fund. Uh, in 2006, 2007, uh, we not only matched our uh, targeted earnings goal, but slightly exceeded it. This year, however, in 07, 08, with the lower interest rate environment, it's much more challenging to uh, achieve the earnings goals that we've established. And one of the benefits of having uh, a full and competent staff is to allow us to meet, uh, meet the earnings goals of, uh, for this year, uh, about $38 million to the general fund. Um, and that's, that's the main reason, is to have a fully competent staff to uh, achieve these earnings goals for the city. And the list is expired? There's no one on the list? Because I believe in the civil service system, which provides opportunities for everyone. When you have exempt positions, you can bring your friends and neighbors and loved ones into a position and bypass people who may have been waiting in line through the fair, impartial civil service system. There is a list currently. We have interviewed everybody on the list. We did, in fact, make some job offers, but because of the uniqueness of the requirements and the duties of the particular positions that we have in our office, either the candidates kind of looked at it and said, you know, this isn't really the kind of job I wanted to do, or sometimes we just simply have a very difficult time finding candidates with the background that we need because the exam is for a general class, and the majority of departments that use this this classification actually need different requirements from those that we do. So we're we're sort of the the little brother or sister on this, and the big brothers and big sisters get the, the majority of the pie. As what's, far as the civil this, service system, what you is know. This, what is this uh, pay? Um, approximately 100000 a year. Okay. The civil service system? As far as the civil service system, this isn't an attempt in any way to go around the parameters and the safeguards of the civil service system. In fact, one of the things that I talk about in the um, ad hoc trainings that I've had at various levels throughout the department because we do have a lot of employees coming in from outside who don't understand what civil service means and why there's these protections. Um, I talk about how the civil service system was implemented throughout history as a means of avoiding the kinds of things that you were talking about, the nepotism, the cronyism, that sort of thing. But really, we have, we have been trying. We have been trying actively for the entire time since 2005 to fill this position through the civil service system using emergency appointments and then interviewing candidates. And as I say, when we do find candidates that are qualified, most of the time they kind of consider things and say, this isn't really the kind of work that I'm good at doing and I don't want to really start doing it now. So how does it change from that to an exempt position? How do we end up bringing someone on board if we can't do it through the testing process? How do we then seek someone to fill this position? Going through the exempt process allows us to look for specifically the requirements that we need in our department, as opposed to having to fit within this more general standard that has to serve people or departments with basically a different market niches is what we're looking for with the candidates. This allows us to target the kinds of candidates with the experience and expertise that we need. And it makes it a lot easier to recruit and find candidates that will actually work within 
the kind of jobs and duties that we need them to do. Yet for the number of years has not had that position. When the economic times were better than they are now. Well, as I said, it hasn't been for lack of trying. Um, we've interviewed at least six times just in the three years that I've been with the department and done more recruiting efforts than that. And it's really been difficult. We have had some people come on board, but we haven't been able to ha be at full staffing because of the limitations that I was talking about. Um, I've been on number four. currently people, but this would be the director. Is that the person on top then? Or the chief yes, this is a division manager. Okay. What does that pay? I don't know. About 120 roughly, I think. Then why couldn't there be an exemption, why couldn't that be done through the civil service system? One of the considerations is that this is a one position class and we thought it would actually be more efficient rather than asking personnel to put together a recruitment plan and then an exam and go through the entire exam process for what is essentially one position. We thought it might be more efficient to just uh, do that all in-house and save personnel's efforts and resources for some of the more urgent classifications that they have to do exams for that serve a greater part of the city population. We could say that for all the jobs. Well, no, not all the jobs have one position in one department. We have that one chief of police, one fire chief. That's true, but those are executive okay. positions. That's a little bit different. Then, too, the, the candidate pool within the city is probably not going to be very big within the civil service system. We'd probably end up, I don't know what it was last time because this was before I started, but the requirements last time, I believe, would have limited the candidate pool. Now, if there are city employees currently that qualify, they can certainly take any kind of exam process that we do in-house, any kind of screening that we would do. And if they qualify, we'd be happy. But this isn't an attempt in any way to try to exclude current city employees. It's just that the position is very specialized. And um, Chris can tell you a little bit more about it. But essentially, it requires a banking background, which is very difficult to find within the city system now. And with all the personnel that you have at the Office of the Treasurer, how many personnel assigned to the Office of the Treasurer? Uh, we have 44 positions. Department-wide? Department-wide. And normally in a department, you'll find a promotional process. You start out here and you work your way up the ladder. If there are no individuals in that department that are seeking that particular position that have experience in the Office of Finance? Well, there are. there is one individual, the one that's acting now, who is gaining experience by acting. But uh, he currently does not have the amount of years at the level that is required for that position. One of the problems that we've had within the Treasury for pretty much since its inception has been the lack of internal promotional opportunities, and I'm sure you've heard Ms. DeFore talk about that, and this is in her long-ranging plan. We do have some ideas in place. We've got some new classifications that we're developing to try to develop our employees from the clerical level on up so that we can give them internal promotions and we are able to retain employees and have a great candidate pool that we know is qualified because we've trained them ourselves, but we're not there yet. We have to say about number four. Julie? If I can ask a question through the chair. Sure. Um, it's unclear from the uh, mayor's uh, communication as to um, if there is an acting uh, if there is somebody in an acting uh, capacity, um, what recruitment efforts they have attempted um, to find somebody who was qualified? And I guess I'm sort of hearing a bit of a contradiction in the comments with respect to providing promotional opportunities within the treasurer's office. Uh, but yet, you know, they want to go outside and. I heard that same comment that while we want to promote within, one on the outside. So I'm very committed to a civil service, fair, equitable system for all. And it used to be certain groups would get all the jobs and other groups were excluded in all departments. And if it was the fire or the police 
or public works, there were certain groups and many people in this room would not be part of the city family if we still went by the old rules. And it was what I call the good old boys club. And I don't support the good old boys club, never have, never will. So my interest in this is to make sure that what this city has, the demographic, is reflective in the workplace. And that's what I try to do as the chair of this committee, is make it fair so people have that opportunity. And if it's the private sector, they can do as they wish. The public sector, we hold it to a different standard. And that's the issue that I have anytime an exempt position comes before this committee. Because exempt means I'm gonna take care of somebody who fits this criteria and other people who may have been waiting in line for a long time, loyal, dedicated employees, don't get that spot. How long have you been with the city? I've been with the city since 1988. 20 years is July. Have you seen a promotional process fair for you? Yes, I have. Okay, so you've benefited from that system. Of course. How about you, sir? I've been with the city uh, for just shy of three years, and um, I was promoted uh, within the last year. Okay, so it's, it's been worked a for you? Yes. How about you? Um, 18 years in both civil service and exempt positions. Which one do you feel more comfortable in? I like both, actually. I like, I agree with the civil service system as fairness, but I also believe when you need a person with a specific expertise that the exemption allowance within the charter is very beneficial. Sir? Uh, I came, came to the city just a little over a year ago, and uh, I came through a similar process as what we're talking about today, and I can say exempt, and I can say that uh, when we have a particular position like mine or like this investment officer position that we're seeking to fill, uh, it really, it, it's technical in nature. Uh, it's it's real benefit to the city to be able to uh, keep all their cards on the table and look at the opportunity for filling a, the position from somebody possibly from the outside that's competent. We don't want to risk, a, because we have a fiduciary responsibility to manage the seven plus billion dollars of assets for the city, we want to make sure we have a very competent staff and minimize the risk of loss in our uh, division activities. And the system is supposed to train people as they come into the lower level, the entry level, and then groom them, train them, let them continue education, and then move to the highest rank, which they want to compete through the civil services, like you, Tom. If I may comment on one of the statements made before, the reason we're not able to promote from within is that nobody who has worked in that division and has anything like the kind of experience we're looking for qualifies due to the number of years of experience that are required for this position. How many um, years are required? Uh, five years. Five so years. Is that standard? Uh, well, it's the department working together with personnel. So we set the standard. We could make it two years, one year, ten years. We set the standard. We could, but again, we have our fiduciary responsibility. And if we just arbitrarily lowered the standard to promote, the, the, for example, the person who is acting today, that's, that's kind of playing around with the civil service system. And it's sort of a cynical working of the system that's supposed to protect us while staying within the parameters. I think it's better to keep in mind our responsibility to the citizens and keep our fiduciary responsibility intact and yes, groom people to come up. That's one of the classes that I alluded to earlier is exactly that, grooming people and assisting them as they go to school and assisting them with experience so that they do qualify for some of the higher level positions in our office. We would love nothing better than to do that. But I hope that that answers what seemed, may have seemed like a contradiction. Because it does affect morale. If someone comes into a position in that capacity, I can see that affecting morale not in a positive but in a negative. And that oftentimes happens when you come into the workplace from the outside. I, something's flushing somewhere. <laughs> I hear that too. I don't know what it is, but they're cleaning some drain out. Um, did you have something else to add? I had just had one minor comment. Um, one of the nice things about the treasurer's office is they really go out of their way to mentor and train employees that work there so that they can promote and move within the organization. So whenever we can and we see a, a person with potential, like this person we see who's in the acting capacity, we definitely want to foster that. We, we do like to, to keep our own, as I'd like to say, and not lose them to DWP, pensions, lasers, everything. So you know, you know the story. Yeah, I know the story. So I just want to say that's our goal, but in, in lieu of that, 
for this level of position and needing the qualifications and the experience and the licenses that we also need the opportunity to be able to go out and find that expertise as well. You added another category, licenses. They have to be licensed? In yeah, this category? position um, after I think it's a year needs to get a certified treasury professional credential through the Association of Finance Professionals, similar to the licenses and certifications required for the investment officers. You came from the private sector? Yes, I did. Why did you come to the city? I came to the city because I thought that uh, the particular job that I have now gives me a lot of responsibility and allows me to take my specific technical expertise that I've acquired over 20 years in the private sector and benefit the people of Los Angeles. So you're making money for us? I think, it's, I think we're on record that it's been a very good year. Uh, so if you can find $150 million, the budget will be settled. <laughs> we're, we're chipping away at it. Tom Juarez down here is, is a big help. Get a, get a jackhammer because I don't think the hammer is going to work. Okay, um, I'm going to recommend on that that we, we approve it, but take back to the GM the concerns that I have. Anytime they come with exempt positions, it's a real concern to me personally and to uh, basically all my colleagues that we give those opportunities, the in-house training, and let those people groom through the system. I think that will be music to her ears. And I know that she wanted to be here today, but she did have something that she had scheduled previously that she was not able to reschedule. OK. Tell her I missed her and uh, my best wishes. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Two and four. Mm. Number five. Five, six, seven. OK. Five. Five. Number five. An item number five, uh, what you have before you is a memorandum from the mayor relative to the re-exemption of one assistant general manager position. This is for the Information Technology Agency. Hello, Ken. Hi. Tell me why we need to re-exempt assistant general manager. Wait, we have to re-exempt technically because the incumbent uh, Cliff Fang went to the Department of Water and Power. Why? They pay more. And a better pension. Right. How long have he been with the department? Um, Cliff was probably with the department the good, I don't know, 15 plus years. I can't blame him for the financial benefit. So he had that position. I remember seeing him before. So he went over and jumped the fence. Um, Re-exemption, so why can't we fill that? Or that's not a civil service position, is it? No. And every time an incumbent leaves, you, uh, leaves, you have to ask for the re-exemption. Now, do you plan to fill that in-house? Um, you know, I, I, the recruitment process will be something discussed between GM and the personnel officer and the mayor. Are there people in-house? Because the previous conversation I had with uh, Finance. How does that apply to you folks? How many people do you have there at uh, IT? I mean, the, the entire department? Yeah. 800 people. So out of 850 people, do you think we have anybody qualified to take that position? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's people who are qualified to be able to do the job. Okay, so how's that going to work? Um, we're going to re-exempt it. Who's going to fill it? How are they going to select that person? The, again, the recruitment process and how that decision is made uh, is still something to be t discussed between the GM personal officer and the mayor's office. Councilman, um, there is an executive directive that, that uh, outlines how we recruit and select um, assistant general managers in the city. So we, um, the department works very closely with our executive recruiter and uh, we do a full recruitment and then there's a review panel to select who moves forward to the first interview panel and then it moves, they select the three at least three of the most highly qualified and refer them to the general manager. So internal employees are yes. part of that process? Yes. Most of our AGMs are selected from within. Yet we're doing an outside recruitment for a position where we have 850 employees? I think the exemption has more to do with um, I mean the, recruitment the movement I that the, excuse well, me? The exemption I understand, Correct. but the recruitment where we have 850 employees in one department, we're going to go to the outside? Not necessarily. Every recruitment, as I think uh, I was stated, every recruitment is, is a little bit different. It depends on the, uh, how many people are in the feeder classes in the department, 
um, what the department needs, the particular expertise they need. So every recruitment's different. So the gen assistant general manager is a management position that the general manager selects to carry out the directive of the general manager. Yes. And that position is currently held by someone or no? Since Cliff has left. Well, the position isn't held. There's an interim. Uh, Roger the interim? Roger Fernandez. How long has he been with the department? I, I you know, I, I think Roger's. Talk about the manager. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Nine, 19 years with the department? 19, 19 years. years. And he's acting assistant general manager? Yes. How many assistant GMs do you guys have? Uh, five. And Cliff is the only guy who decided to go to Water and Power? <laughs> uh, well, in my short history at ITA, he's the only one who has left. He went to Water and Power. Okay, so the other position is filled. So Roger's currently filling that. Mm -hmm. um, did he fill that when Cliff left? Yes. Okay. So I, I assume that he and others would be eligible to compete for that position. Absolutely. And could that position be, since it's exempt, is there a requirement that it go out for review, or could they select someone to say this is the person without having a competition from the agency? There is a requirement in accordance with the executive directive for some competition. It could be competition just within. We don't have to go out and target recruit outside of the city, but we do have to post, and when we do post, people apply both within and outside of the city. And this is posted for inside and outside? Yes. It's on our website. It's what? It's on our website. On our website. That's how they post? That's how we post. We no. can do more if, there, if there's a desire to go into professional periodicals and that sort of thing, but normally we post for at least a week on our city website. Okay. And, and, and if that is then filled with someone other than Roger Fernandez, what happens to him if he's filling it now? If Roger was not successful, he would uh, revert back to a uh, director of systems position within the department. There's How much difference in pay those positions? Um, that's probably 20000 And then we write, why rate him, right, Jim? That seems to be the trend. I'm being very candid. I put all the cards on the table. I'd love to put you on the hot seat. If Mr. Fernandez is a director of systems, and that's a civil service class, and under those circumstances, it would be extremely rare for, for us to be y rating but I'm looking at the CAO because obviously the y rate is based on the uh, CAO's recommendation. But ordinarily, if somebody is in an acting capacity, they don't have, they technically do not have the job. And because they don't have the job, they do have the ability to revert back to, to his prior class. Under that circumstances, it would be, in my experience, having worked in the CAO's office, it would be extremely unusual to recommend a Y rate for somebody who is basically reverting to a position from which he is merely in an acting capacity. And how long has he been acting that capacity? The, he's, he was uh, put in shortly after Cliff left, so almost six months. Six months? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Parks? Mr. Carter? <laughs> Well, I'll answer their questions then. Um, I'd like to find out what happens with the position. So once it's filled, if we can report back to this committee, um, who gets that position? I want to keep tabs of these exempt positions and what we're doing with the uh, selection of personnel. Okay, we will do. Thank you. All right, so that one's moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Number six. Oh, I know about this one. The city administrative officer and the community redevelop redevelopment agency have submitted reports relative to memoranda of understanding for a five-year period. This is from July 1st, 2007 through June 30th, 2012. This is for the basic professional supervisor and management bargaining units, uh, and they are represented by the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Okay. I was asked to waive this, and the reason I didn't waive it is because I wanted to see the representative. 
So if you'll please come forward, Madam Representative. From AFSCME? From AFSCME. <laughs> She's such a pleasant. She's such a pleasant lady. I love to see her and make sure that everybody knows what's going on with this. Uh, the city has asked that contracts be reopened mm -hmm. because of financial situation with the city, and my concern and why I wanted to have it on the table mm -hmm. is to make sure because certain unions have not agreed to that, other unions have. I just wanted to make sure that there was an understanding if this was part of that agreement where there is a reopener and, and I feel that we betray our employees when we give them something one day and then take it away the next day. So I wanted to make sure, Cheryl, that you knew everything that was going on with this and there was no hidden agenda. That's why I didn't waive it, as I wanted it all out in the open. It, it troubles me when we give someone a contract and give them a salary increase and then the package just will go to 2012 and then three months later we say, by the way, we're going to renegotiate you down. And all of a sudden, they've decided to purchase a house, Correct. have a new husband or wife, and mm -hmm. three new children, and all of a sudden, financial crisis hits. So I'm aware that certain unions are not receptive to the reopener. Mm -hmm. So my question, number one, is there a reopener on this? And the lady's shaking her head no. Mm -hmm. If there's no reopener on this, that's a problem. There is not an economic reopener on this country. And why would we bring this forward when we're asking all the other unions to reopen their contracts? It makes absolutely no sense to me. Mm -hmm. And you go to EERC with me and the issues that the mayor has been raising about the lack of funding. How do we then tell our employees that are on a contract that we want to reopen because of the financial situation when they're telling teachers in this state that they're going to get laid off, they're going to cut funding from the school districts, and we're going to give a salary increase to certain groups and other groups are going to end up taking a pay cut. How do we then logically make this balance to be fair? I voted no on the water and power contract because I thought it was unfair to all their city employees. I thought it's unfair to give them a sweetheart package with a ceiling and a floor and no one else gets that. So I voted no when that came to the council floor because my conscience said I'm not going to take care of one group city employees and ignore the rest. So now what we have with this is we're going to other unions, asking them to reopen, and we're bringing forth a contract that does not have a reopener. That makes no sense to me. How can you justify and explain that? I'll defer to ask me. Well. Uh, you see where I'm coming with this? Well, let me, let me say, as you're very well aware, um, um, the coalition of city unions um, reached an agreement with the city of Los Angeles for five-year terms. Our CRA locals were part of that coalition and negotiated an agreement in terms of, of the economic framework that is similar. However, um, but don't they have a reopener? Well, let me. Okay. So when we when we came to the table, there were interests um, that the city had and the unions had. Um, the set of interests that the CRA presented in mutual gains was quite different and unique really to the community redevelopment agency than those than the city um, concerned about the general fund I think it's important to understand that the CRA is not a general fund it does not rely on the general fund its funding sources are completely independent um, from the city and is not I mean I think the, uh, the department the CRA should talk more about the funding sources but there were really there was really a different agenda, if you will, in terms of the CRA's interest, um, and the mutual gains process went a somewhat different way in terms of different issues that were explored and resolved. Um, so with that, I, I, I would think it would be helpful to talk about the funding streams that support the CRA. I think you know, Council Member Zion, uh, I'm our Chief Financial Officer. We do not uh, use any general fund dollars, and our funding base is completely different than the city's. Uh, this was discussed at the table. Management was not opposed to a financial reopener, uh, but that is not where we ended up. But water and power, the airport, <coughs> they're not general funded departments. That's correct. So why should we take care of those employees and ignore the other employees? Why is it fair if you work at the water and power, you get a salary with great benefits, and then you come here and you work for a department that has an MOU with the city, and you're now facing a pay cut and the benefit reduction. I just don't think that's fair. It's like you've got two children. One child gets all the clothes, the brand new car. The other child gets hand-me-down clothes and takes the bus. 
I just don't feel we should treat our employees in that manner, whether it's CRA, which represents an entity dealing with issues in the city of Los Angeles, or another entity. I think that what we do is Cliff, I forgot his last name, he went to Water and Power. It's a sweeter deal. So what we're doing is ignoring some of our employees and taking care of other employees. To me, it's absolutely unfair. So the funds come from a process. And if you're working the CRA, or you're working Water and Power, or you're working the clerk's office, or you're working the CLA's office, the CAO, or wherever, I mean, we, we've got all these different rules and regulations, and it doesn't make any sense. How we're supposed to run a city, which we call the city of Los Angeles, with all the different functions, and make it fair. Police and fire are exempt. They don't want to reopen their contract. Yet the mayor's adamant that we reopen contracts to try and ensure this 150 plus million dollar budget. But now, I here in good conscience sit and say, okay, we're going to approve this for the CRA, which is not funded by the city of Los Angeles, but works side by side with city employees. Where's the logic? I mean, it's going down different tracks. I try to come into this office with some common sense. And every time I try to apply common sense, it seems that we've got these obscure uh, rules that make no sense. And that's why the issue of if we're going to open up contracts, we open up contracts. Whether we furlough five days or whether everyone takes a 5% pay cut, I don't want to see people lose their jobs. Hmm. But what I hear in the news is the school districts talking about laying off teachers and increasing class size. Education is critical. The governor said, prison guards, you're not going to get the pay increase you thought you were going to get. I mean, we see this economic disaster, and it's like certain departments are exempt, immune, and other people are going to take it and have a reduction in compensation. Well, go ahead. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, first I'm of really all, trying to sort this out in my mind. Let me say, um, well, let me say um, that that we worked um, vigorously in the mutual gains process for the for the general fund departments and reached agreements um, using the mutual gains process. And a lot of the city's concerns were around sort of the economic condition of the city. Um, and we are, you know, in in sort of briefing sessions now um, with the CAO's office to learn more about the financial conditions um, so that we can begin to make assessments and, um, and engage in that process. And you folks have been very honest, very upfront, very direct, and very cooperative. I want to commend you and the other unions that are part of that. That's one hat. Right. Now you're in here in another hat. Well, it's the same hat um, in that we, again, use the mutual gains process um, the Community Redevelopment Agency and the CAO um, came to the table with different interests, different concerns. And so while this agreement has the standard economic framework of the other coalition agreements, many of the issues that, are, um, that were resolved and worked through are quite different um, and really um, support um, an agenda that the Community Redevelopment Agency management was interested in pursuing during this five-year period. Um, and so again, mutual gains means that, you know, the parties come to the table with their interests. And I think that this contract and the workers at the CRA worked very diligently to try to tackle, um, you know, some of the issues that the CRA management was interested in pursuing and, and vice versa. And so the contract reflects, and, and let me say it was a very difficult agreement to reach. I mean, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of, um, serious and hard work on both sides to achieve the agreements. Um, and I have to say that it, it from my perspective, um, I think the unions went a long way to try to meet the needs that management articulated um, while in the context of the solid economic framework that was negotiated by the coalition unions. Um, so I know Tom Coltis from CR um, you, CAO you're was personally involved. Did you hear the talk about <coughs> discussions about reopening contracts? and how the issue is certain unions, police and fire, don't want to reopen their contracts, yet everyone else is being asked, directed, encouraged, motivated to open up a contract. How do we, um, we and there may be we different would, issues here. We will here. continue to help and encourage the, the sworn contracts as well. But then why do we exclude this yeah. from a reopener on this and not include it in a reopener? On this particular one, if you look at the coalition reopener, the coalition reopener was an up and down reopener. 
and so on the downside that's relatively straightforward and and so for us in the general fund it was pretty straightforward we could figure that out the the upside for the general fund we thought we were fine on because we weren't really projecting massive revenue growth over the next five year period, so we figured that was okay as well. The revenue structure in the CRA is completely different, and the CRA can speak to this far better than I can, but this we had 1% and 3% triggers on, the, on these reopeners. While CRA could have a 3% adjustment in revenue on one project possibly, so that whole structure was not a viable structure. Um, in addition, yeah, Cheryl's correct in this regard, we went a long way on this contract in terms of there's the, the issues that the CRA wanted to address in this contract were not primarily economic. They were primarily around the idea of getting control of that organization. Right. And I think we've made a lot of progress on that issue. Yeah, in exchange for that progress, you know, the, the downside reopener went by the wayside. And the revenues are assured for the time from 07 to 12? There's no fluctuation or possible reduction in dollars to the CRA? There's because of tax revenues being reduced, property assessments being modified? That's right. Our um, but wait. That's right. What our budget is nearly entirely funded based on property tax so what increment. When, what happens when the so property is, taxes are reduced? It is flattening, and um, we so. expect it to be flat or stable for the next few years before we see it come back up. We do have substantial reserves at the CRA. Only a very small portion of our budget is an operating budget. The remainder is a project mm -hmm. budget. So mm -hmm. it's a fundamentally different financial structure. Than the city structure, we do feel that uh, if we budget conservatively, which we are planning to do through this downward cycle, that we will be able to afford the additional $20 million that this contract will cost us over the next five years. If the property is reassessed at a lower value, which means fewer dollars into the fund. Yes, sir. And while you say this contract is five years, approximately $20 million. How much do they have in the CRA fund? We have a redevelopment project budget of approximately $500 million. If we had to reduce our investment in projects in the community to cover the costs of our employees, uh, we would do that. So the community that is waiting for revitalization would not be revitalized so the employees could continue receiving the compensation package. First, before we did that, we would make sure that we held our operating costs short. So for example, we may choose not to fill vacant positions to create salary savings so that we could cover the increases. We would, we have made a commitment to our board and to the city to keep our, uh, operating costs sort of rational and conservative and we certainly continue to do that through this cycle to continue to make that commitment through this cycle how many employees do we have at CRA we have 270 authorized positions we currently have about 240 of those positions filled and I think about 200 or less around 200 are actually uh, in the bargaining units <clears throat> 220 maybe in the bargaining units and this goes till 2012. Yes, sir. We feel that it's a very solid package for our employees, and we are committed to making an investment in our employees. I don't dispute any of that. And if this was good economic times, I would say rah, rah, kumbaya, but it's sad economic times. And I don't know how long the sad economic times are gonna continue. And for those 200 employees in this union and the 240 positions that are filled, it's a sweet deal. It's a very nice deal. I don't think the city employees on the COLA have received that. Am I correct? For the coalition, they have the identical compensation COLA package mm -hmm. as you see in this agreement. I know, but I'm talking about non-exempt city employees, uh, council 
staff, mayor staff, et cetera. For the non-rep employees, we'll be bringing back the non-rep report to the ERC at the next meeting. So they haven't received anything? No, not yet. Okay, and then that's, that, that's what boggles my mind to say, we're already in the hole, we're gonna give a salary and go deeper in the hole. That makes no sense. Measure S pass, we're still in the hole, and as sales revenue continues to fall, we go deeper in the hole, yet we're gonna give salary increases. I don't understand the logic behind that. And at EERC, the mayor kind of throws his hands up and says, what are we doing? I have a real difficult time with this. I have a very difficult time with this. Just for the philosophy that you've got representatives in different bargaining units. One person is gonna go and possibly get a salary reduction another person is not gonna to be touched. And we may not complete a CRA project because we have to fund the compensation package for the people. Well, let me say, um, this agreement, you know, if, if sort of notwithstanding the report, I mean, it seems to me that the economics of the city of Los Angeles budget are completely different than the economics of the CRA. And you heard it's a relatively small workforce. Um, in relation to a very large um, sort of budget. Um, so it's a very different situation than, the, than city services under general fund, which of course are what, you know, 80% people. Right. Um, they're, they're all services that are directly provided by people and it's a very different operation than exists at the CRA and the economics are very different ones. Um, obviously, you know, I'm advocating strongly that you would accept and move forward this agreement because from our perspective, we dealt in good faith um, and seriously to meet the interests that were articulated by management um, in this process. Um, and to do anything else but to move this forward, I think, would, to, um, would really to undermine the entire mutual gains process. I disagree with you. I think this committee has a responsibility for the overall function of the city of Los Angeles and for the personnel to deliver that service. Now, if I had Bernard Parks here and Tony Cardenas here, I'm sure Bernard Parks would be agreeing with me. I don't know about Tony Cardenas, but I know Bernard Parks' position on the budget. That's what I'm looking at, is where well, he would come from, what the whole council would come from. Well, it, it, it just, I, I find it hypocritical that we take from one and we don't take from another. Well, Councilman Zine, um, I, I think that this, the city's gonna have to determine its level of effort in um, community redevelopment, there's nothing in any agreement that would preclude a management right from calling for a layoff, and then the union would necessarily begin to meet and confer about the impact of a layoff. And so if things became so dire um, within the CRA that there's nothing in this agreement that would preclude um, that process. Um, well, I know that the ERC, the mayor is talking some severe impact on the city of Los Angeles operations. And whether that means furloughs or layoffs or no hiring, mm -hmm. but I, I've never heard such talk since I've been around, that's 40 years. The last time I think was even mentioned was Proposition 13, mm -hmm. any kind of impact. So I just don't want any hidden agenda. I don't want you folks to be duped into something that's not real. I'm troubled by the fact that there's no reopener here because of the economic situation. And that if the revenues reduce, which they are gonna reduce, Property's not selling like it did. We're not getting the property transfer tax. The increments that go into CRA aren't gonna be continuing as they have been. So that whole economic downslide, which may happen for another year or two years or who knows when it's gonna end, we keep talking recession, possible depression, catastrophe. Uh, well, It's a sad environment. Well, as I say, there is nothing in this agreement to preclude, as any management might, to call for layoff in that kind of economic situation. And then the union, of course, would be at the table to negotiate the impact of that layoffs and as a union rep, you know, alternatives to the layoff. So, um, so you understand that part? Absolutely. See, I wanna make sure that when that happens, because I honestly in my heart think it's gonna happen, that something is going to have a major impact on the salaries and the benefit package of city employees that there's no misunderstanding that that catastrophe, I believe, is imminent. And if that's the case, then you folks need to understand the consequences on your members. Now, I came from a union, as you know, mm -hmm. and you fight for your members. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I've always believed in being honest and putting the cards up front and saying this is what we've got. And what I've heard from the mayor, what I've heard from the folks in the city mm -hmm. hall, is that it's not getting any brighter, it's getting darker. 
and a darker means that hole We're with no that. bottom. That's what I want to know. Mm -hmm. And that when you are aware of that, when the bell strikes and they're told you're not going to hire anybody else, you're going to cut 50 personnel, you don't come back and say, Councilman, you told me something different. Well, no, there's nothing in this agreement that would preclude the agency from, you know, in that kind of dire circumstance from calling for layoff and the union would be immediately at the bargaining table on, on something like that. And, and that, this agreement does not preclude that. Okay. Well, you don't have a reopener, you understand that there may be some other consequences. Yes. And when we go to EERC and talk about this, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that everybody's on the same page with it. I don't want to see anybody harmed <coughs> financially because people get a job, they live a certain lifestyle, they buy certain things. That's right. Then all of a sudden, they don't have those dollars. And a lot of people live in check to check. And I appreciate that and I want to be empathetic. Well, that's, I mean, you're right. I mean, that's why we're working so diligently to try to be creative about how to deal with this. And, and I know you're aware that that's happening and well, yeah, thought is going into that. But like the police department said, we're not going to reopen it. And the mayor's made an adamant that police aren't going to be touched. Mm -hmm. So you've got one group that's going to be exempt and everybody else is going to bite the bullet. Well, that becomes the loss. an issue for the council to weigh in on. You're right. You're right. And clearly, um, public safety is a major issue. But also, CRA is a major issue because if we don't revitalize, and I got a revitalization there in my district, if we don't improve those communities, then there's more deterioration, more vacant storefronts, more blight, and more businesses not putting in sales tax. No question. And we think that, I mean, again, you know, the, the, the agency came to the table with some interest in uh, being able to do some things with their classification plan, being able to kind of recruit the kind of personnel that they need to, to, to perform the work. And so there was, all of these issues were addressed um, because there were clearly interests to try to build a workforce that is going to be most effective in, um, in you know, m moving the mission of the CRA, which we're committed to and the workers of the CRA are absolutely committed to as CRA, um, you know, career professional employees. Um, and they have families to support and bills right. to pay. Um, this goes to Housing, Community, and Economic Development Committee. Does it go to Budget and Finance Committee? No. Why? It doesn't have the impact on the general there fund. Okay. Well, I'm not going to make you go to budget and finance anyway because you wouldn't want to do that. Thank you. <laughs> if I didn't like you, I'd send you there. Well, I appreciate it. So, any other comments? No further comments. I would just like to add uh, briefly that it was stated several times in the negotiation process. There was the reminder that the CRA has gone down to 176 employees when there were no funds. And in the course of this, there were the issues with the state that came up indicating, you know, this could have an impact. So if, uh, eat your steak today and you may be on beans tomorrow. That was made very clear in the process. Okay, because you're at EERC, Tom, you're at mm -hmm. EERC, Junior, and I just want to make sure that when we have this debate there, mm -hmm. everybody is on the same page and that it's fair to the employees that they understand. Because it's, you know, it, correct me if I'm wrong, the mayor has made some very gloomy projections for the city of Los Angeles economically very gloomy projections. So I'm just conveying that to you. And that's oh, yeah. why I didn't want to just send it through, which I could have waived. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, boom strikes. And then you'd say, well, why didn't you tell me? No, I hear you. The, the, the other thing that we're very concerned about, though, is timeliness. Um, because the CRA does have a relationship with the state, we think it's really in the LA CRA's interest to have a, a labor contract in place um, before the state moves any further in terms of its own budget deliberations. And so we're asking that this would move expeditiously to be able to protect, um, you know, to be able to protect these commitments and to be able to protect the CRA. Can the state take money away if they wish? Your $500 million? They have in the past and there's nothing to prevent them from doing so again. So if, what happens if they take away, we approve this, then what happens? And we depend on this to get things done because you've managed it properly. Well, how do we work that out? Then we will have to explore all of our all of our alternatives. I think, as Ms. Parisi has explained, well. Absolutely. But I think we think a contract in place is, is an assistance that will help. to both parties. It Th that helps, will help preserve it. It helps the employees. It's an additional commitment for the agency. But as far as the state taking away money, state doesn't care what our obligations are to anybody. So it wouldn't be substituted with, G, uh, with general funds? No, they just, they, absolutely they're on their not. Own. That's right. They either get it or they're out of luck. 
The state, you mean? No, the employees. If the the state, employees. If the state decides we're going to sweep, sweep your CRA funds. If the state swept all $500 million of our project funds, which, which I doubt they would do unless they intend to shut down redevelopment agencies, um, then, and the only funds we had remaining were operational funds that were dwindling, then we'd have to talk about whether we would have to reduce our workforce. Or eliminate it. I mean, that's such a... Well, yes. I mean, it's really... <laughs> well, you know what the mayor... Uh, there's, you know, the anything... In this economic climate, council member, as you know, and you've articulated, anything is possible, and we yeah. don't have any control over it, so I don't... I wouldn't want to use uh, sort of extreme projections to deny our employees uh, increases, which I think they deserve. We I'm not disputing they don't deserve it, but I know what I've heard from the governor's office. They're going to cut school funding. They're going to cut medical programs. That's they're going right. to cut a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. And education was one of his main agendas. And when you're talking about teachers, I've heard Mr. Duffy from LA Unified, they're gonna lay off teachers. That to me is a major impact. And if we're gonna lay off teachers and then cut projects, I mean, the bottom line is, I just don't want any hidden agenda. I want it all out so everybody knows where we're going. So don't go out and buy yourself a brand new car. Don't go out and buy yourself a brand new million dollar house. It probably isn't a good investment right now. That's all I'm coming from, being fair with everybody. Okay, Cheryl? We hear you. I still love you as a nice person. All right. Union lady. But make sure that people understand the consequences. I think it, members are here today and they've heard you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Number seven. So you're approving it? Yes. On item number seven, what you have before you is uh, CEO reports. This is relative to additional staffing for the implementation of the Northeast Los Angeles Interim Control Ordinance. And this item has been to plum, uh, I'm sorry, Planning and Land Use Management Committee. And it's also referred to Budget and Finance Committee. I thought we had a problem with this one. Now you show up. I needed you before. I was on my way. I was, you know, once a month we have a conflict with Coliseum. I know, Commission. I know. We just approved some. I really need your help on yeah. six, but it's now done. Um, seven. See, it was. Huh? Why no? Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm Jacob Wexler with the uh, CEO's office. Uh, in February 2007, uh, this committee heard a report recommending a position in funding for uh, the planning department, a city planner, for the Northeast Los Angeles uh, Inner Control Ordinance. Uh, at that time, you requested that we report back with a, uh, a history of a five-year history of positions that have been added for these short-term projects in the planning department. So. Uh, I guess now both of, both the original report and that follow-up report are before you, I think. Uh, the, just a summary of the follow-up, uh, we identified 16 positions that have been added in the last five years for these short-term positions. 13 of them were added for uh, ongoing Wait, excuse support. Excuse me. Yeah. Is anyone here from planning? Okay, no one here from planning. So if they're not here to uh, position on this matter, I'm going to make a recommendation that we receive and file the CAO report dated November 8th and June 5th. That might solve the problem. Okay? That'll take it easy for you. We're going to receive a file, Mr. Park. Okay? okay. All right. No. Is that number seven. Does that still come to budget and finance? Yes. Okay. Well, it's receive and file. Does it still have to go after receive and file it? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we'll receive and file. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you. We're done. Yeah, we were trying to get back on that thing. Probably it was a little longer. Probably issue. <laughs> <laughs> I'll